welcome the Lord Jesus into this place. It's good to be at church with you guys. Come on. We have come to save. We have come to exalt the Savior of all. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus. You know, come on right here. There is.
doors to God's goodness. So let's start by putting our hands together like this. You're welcome here, Lord. We've come to worship you, to honor you, because better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Let our praise be your welcome. Sing this with me. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. Yes, Lord. <laughs> we are here for you. With our hearts we say today, let your breath come from heaven and fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. Tell them today now. We are here for you. Every voice we say to you our hearts are open.
Church, let's take a breath and take in the grace of God. He's welcome in this place and we breathe out praise. It's what we've been doing, we've been singing. And I love that. Let every heart adore, let every soul awake. Let's sing that, believe that with passion, with some grit and some fire, that every soul in this place, but outside this place would awake yes. to the reality of Jesus Christ. Wake up, city of Colorado Springs. Wake up. We're talking to you, city. Wake up in the name of our God. Let's come today in wonder and awe. We are in holy, in a holy space here, sacred space, holy ground. The Lord told Moses, right? When you're in a holy place, you're on holy ground, so take off your sandals. It's these man-made items, these man-made things that stood between his flesh and the divine. So let's ask the Lord to show us what, what are those sandals for us? Is it fear? Is it the need for security? Is these attachments that we have? God, remove it so we can stand on this holy ground so our, our weak flesh, our humanity, our frailty can touch the perfect divine today. So we can touch you, God, the king of the ages, all things, the king of all things. It's amazing, God, that we can stand here as frail as we are touch the divine. So we do it today, Lord. We long for you, God. We long for you. We want more of you, God. So come and flood this place. Rise up here, Lord. You're welcome here. <laughs> oh, hail King Jesus. It was a moment when the lights went out death had claimed its victory the king of love had given it up the king of love had given of his life it was the darkest day the darkest day in history oh. here on the cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned Final breath. One final breath, and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. What sacrifice was made? As the heavens roll All hail King Jesus
all hail King Jesus, Savior of the world. All hail King Jesus, the Lord of heaven and of earth. Oh God, there is an endless list of reasons of why you're worthy of every ounce of our worship. And this morning, God, we're, we're calling, we're thinking about the reasons specifically that we are worshiping you today. God, you're perfect, you're loving, you're so holy, you're kind, you're gentle, you're powerful, you're in charge. God, thank you. As we worship you, you welcome us into your presence. You invite us in and you wanna give us good gifts. So this morning, we just thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would pour yourself out. <laughs> Thinking of that scripture in James where it says, every good and perfect gift comes from him, the father of heavenly lights. The Lord wants to bless us today with his presence. Sometimes our lives can look like a, a bit of a desert wasteland. And I'm wondering this morning if we could just in our own words, in our own way, in the quietness of this moment, just ask again for the Holy Spirit. The Father delights, it's his best gift, right? He gives us more of himself in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come, saturate the dry places of our lives. God, we need you. We saturate that situation that looks like a barren wasteland. Will you bring life where there seems to be no life? Hmm. You're so good. Hmm. God wants his church to be a place so full of the Holy Spirit that it actually overflows with the Holy Spirit and reflects his generosity, reflects his gifts to the world. As we get ready to receive our tithes and offerings, um, I had this moment where I was reminded of, of the generosity of God. I was spending time with Pastor Jeremias, the pastor of Nueva Vida, our Spanish-speaking congregation. And he said, we got to the end of kind of walking all around. I'd been down to the building many times. I was like, I want you to see it all again. And he said, you want, let me show you my favorite part. We went into this separate little house and down into this basement. He goes, you're about to enter the world's tiniest Walmart. And we walked down into this basement and he said, you know what happens here? And he got emotional. He said, people that come to our church, maybe they're in our country for the very first time and they feel so vulnerable and they don't know where their next meal is coming from. They don't know if they can provide for their kids. I bring them into this mini Walmart and I hand them my sack and I say, go for it. Whatever you need is yours. How much? Oh, it's free. It's a gift from God. And he said, you wouldn't believe the look on their face when they realize that this room is theirs. Guys, that's the generosity of God reflected through the church. That's what new life is all about, right? Guys, that's why our giving matters. Our giving matters because it's first, it's foremost, it's worship to God. But then we get to turn around and say, you know who God is? God is so generous. And we're gonna show you in the practical, simplest ways. Church, as we pray and ask God to provoke our heart's generosity, let's think about what he could do as we unite together under his power and goodness. God, oh, we stand here today so grateful to be called your sons and your daughters. And as we give, we just wanna say, thank you, God. Will you pour out your blessings to the needy places in our city and around the world? Will you shine a big spotlight on your awesomeness through our giving? We pray and the church together said, amen. Multiple ways to give. Let's worship together. I let it breathe me. <laughs> Bow before. Come on, we gotta sing it again. Let every tongue confess. Lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven singing. Oh, 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 oh. We're singing. Oh,
and say, shoo-wee. <laughs> that was awkward. <laughs> Amen. So good to be together. Friends, you might have noticed that Katie's leaning a little to the left today. It's because she has a rock on the left finger there. So congratulations, Katie. Getting engaged to Derek Greaves, who's downtown with our congregation today. So he's not with us, but congrats to you. We love you. All right, greet one another in the name of the Lord Jesus. Pastor Brady will be up momentarily to preach. Grace and peace. Good morning, good morning. How are you? Yeah, three of you. Try that one more time, you doing okay? Doing very well? Yes, so good to see you. It's good to be back with you today. Uh, I wanna make a, a great announcement. I think uh, it's, it's encouraging to me at least. Um, as you remember, when I came here 15 years ago, we were just riddled with debt, $26 million of debt, which by the way, that's $155,000 a month mortgage payment. I don't know if you've ever had to do that, but it's pretty, pretty difficult. We started though years ago, being intentional about paying off the debt. And at the beginning of this year, I told you we had $9.6 million of debt. And we believe by God's grace, we're headed sooner rather than later to being debt free. And I'm believing that. Now it ha hasn't happened yet, but we're, we're getting really close. $9.6 million in January, as of today, it's down to $5 million. So. $4.6 million of debt paid off since January. So I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for your generosity, for praying, for obeying, for walking alongside me in this journey to being debt free. It is really critical. Listen, our world is getting more and more broken, which means the church needs to be stronger. And we can be stronger when we're not paying debt. I love the bankers. If you're in banking, I love you, I appreciate you. I just don't wanna be a customer much longer. You can bless other people with that money. So I'm, I'm telling you that because in a couple of weeks on the first weekend of December, on December 4th, we're going to have a special legacy offering. And I'm gonna give you the opportunity along with me to come forward and by God's grace, give something over and above what you normally give and pay this debt down with me. So I'm, I'm asking you for the next two or three weeks, would you pray and just do whatever the Lord asks you to do. Uh, Pam and I are prayed. We have a number that we prayed about. We'll bring our offering with you on that Sunday. And we're gonna have baskets down front. If you've never done this, it's really an emotional, moving moment to come forward with the people around you and give something sacrificial. And we do that a couple of times a year and it's gonna happen on Sunday, December 4th. So thank you so much for being a part of that. I'm excited, it's gonna be joyful, I can't wait to stand here in front of you and tell you that we're debt free. That's gonna happen soon. I believe that in Jesus' name, amen. You okay with that? Will you be excited when I announce that? Yeah, me too. Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter four. 1 Timothy chapter four. If you did not hear last Sunday's message by Pastor Daniel, it, was, it may have been one of my favorite messages of all time at New Life in 15 years. It was so powerful. Uh, if you've never heard the scriptures explained about what it means for women to be involved in the ministry of the church, he tackled a very delicate, sensitive subject with tremendous wisdom and grace. I thought he opened up the scriptures in a beautiful way and really helped us understand the context and the moment that Paul was writing to. So go, to, go back, if you didn't hear it, go back to our YouTube channel or to our website and uh, download that and listen to it this week. So I just wanna say thank you to Pastor Daniel. So we're moving along now in 1 Timothy chapter four. 
We're gonna read verses 12 through 14. And in these verses, these three verses, Paul talks about two things that we're gonna talk about today. He's gonna talk about following Jesus when you're young and the laying on of hands. I've never really preached why in the church that we are to lay hands on each other and pray for each other. I'm gonna really try to unpack that today and help you understand that and see this in a fresh new way. So let's read this together. First Timothy chapter four, verse 12. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Now for context, Paul is very, he's at the end of his life when he's writing this. We don't know exactly how many months he has left, but he knows, I think the Lord has revealed to him that he's about to die. And one of his last acts as an apostle is to make sure the church in Ephesus has a good leader. So he's already appointed Timothy as the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And uh, as Pastor Daniel described last week, it was a mess. The, the town was a mess. The church was a mess. I mean, Timothy had his work cut out. And I think Paul realized that Timothy was probably a little discouraged, trying to lead this group of people that were all over the map. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young though. He says, but set an example for the believers, listen to, listen to the example, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. He says, and until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and to preaching and to teaching. He was reminding Timothy of his primary assignment, his primary purpose of leading the church. And I love verse 14, he says, and do not neglect your gift. That's the very encouraging, by the way, for someone to remind you of that from time to time. You're gifted. New Life Church, I want you to look, look at me just for a moment. As your pastor, as someone who loves you and prays for you, I wanna remind you today, you're gifted. You, you're full of the Holy Spirit. You're more full of the Holy Spirit than you've imagined. You have more of God working through you than you have possibly imagined in your lifetime. That's true for me too. I think we're all gonna to get to heaven and realize we had more inside of us than we ever thought. More grace, more wisdom, more clarity than we've ever had before. He says, don't neglect that gift though. If it's there, and it is, don't neglect it. He says, it was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders, listen to this, when they laid their hands on you. I love that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the continuously articulate speaking scriptures. Thank you that these scriptures are alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, able to discern our thoughts, to challenge us, to change us, to convict us if necessary. And we give you permission to do all that. Challenge us today. Change us today. Convict us today. With the help of your spirit, let us walk closer to Jesus as a result of these scriptures being spoken over us today. And we ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You're okay with that? If you agree with any of that, say amen. amen. So here's the first thing about this passage that Paul was reminding a young man. Paul was reminding him there is no junior Holy Spirit. There's not a Holy Spirit for young'uns. That's very Southern, by the way. And it's not a Holy Spirit for older people. The same Spirit that is at work in the most mature believer you've ever met is the same spirit that's hovering over our children, hovering over the, I think that it's hovering over babies in the wombs of their mothers. The spirit is present. The Psalms give us a picture of that, that in the womb of the mother, the spirit is at work hovering over that embryo as it grows into a fully developed human, but the spirit has never left you. The Holy Spirit has been present with you from the moment of conception till you breathe your final breath and spend an eternity with him, the spirit is present. But oftentimes we tell young men and women, hey, go sit at the table and be quiet. L listen and learn. And by the way, listening and learning is for all of us. All of us, regardless of our age, probably need to do be better at listening and learning. But sometimes we tell young people that we don't wanna hear from them and they have plenty to say. And the Bible is full of stories of young men and women doing great exploits, great things for God. So last Sunday, Pastor Daniel kind of showed you a biblical map of how women were used. So I wanna show you how young men and women were used. Joseph, the story of Joseph is a story about a young man who was falsely imprisoned by his own brothers. 
I mean, you're talking about a dysfunctional family. You probably have never been thrown into a pit and sold into slavery, but that's what his brothers did to him. I mean, that's his family. But it, what, what they intended to be for harm ended up positioning him in a place of power. He ended up in the king's palace. And because of his influence, he was able to rescue Israel in their season of famine and drought. So he was perfectly positioned to be an advocate for his family when all the food and water ran out. This is a young man being put in a place of power. Daniel is another young man who would not bow his knee to Nebuchadnezzar. He would not bow his knee. He would not take on their traditions and customs. He refused to worship the wrong thing. That sound familiar, by the way? Sounds familiar, this is a temptation for all of us to worship idols instead of the resurrected God. But Daniel refused to bow his knee. In fact, he was put into a pit with some lions. That's one of my, growing up, it was one of my favorite stories of them looking over in the lion's den and there he is surviving in the lion's den. Esther, who Dan, uh, Pastor Daniel mentioned Esther last week, but Esther was a young woman, probably in her 20s, maybe even a 19 or 20 years old. When she, her beauty, her grace allowed her to be put in a place of influence, but she was a young woman who was willing to be used. Samuel is another story. Samuel was a young man who was trying, living in the, in the church basically, his mom dropped him off, which we don't do that anymore. I just wanna remind you to take all the kids home that you brought with you today. <laughs> but Samuel was left at the church and he starts to hear God's voice. Listen, as a young boy, listen moms and dads, you have one assignment in your life before your kids get out under your care. Teach them to hear the voice of the Lord. And this is the story of Samuel who was discerning and listening and he had to go in four different times to Eli. Eli, what am I hearing? What am I hearing? Finally, he says, Lord, I'm hearing you. I'll do whatever you ask. As a little boy, the spirit came upon him and he ended up being the most profound prophet in the history of Israel, really. He laid hands and anointed two different kings. Saul and David were anointed by this young man. God used him as a prophet, a prophetic voice to the nation. And we know David, I mean, David, he was a young man when he charged down that hill to confront Goliath, when he guarded his father's sheep against bears and lions. David was a young man full of courage. Listen, some of the most courageous people I know are young men and women, because they haven't learned to be afraid yet. They, they, they got the, youth, the courage of their youth, the tenacity of their youth. Let's not squelch that. Let's not, let's, not, uh, let's not mute that. Let's encourage that. When we see young men and women with bold voices, prophetic voices, let's stir it up in them. Let's fan it into flame. And of course, maybe the most famous young person in all the Bible was Mary, who was you know, not looking to be you know, God's mom, wasn't looking to carry a baby in her womb and have to you know, explain that to all of her friends and neighbors that it was the Holy Spirit that made her pregnant. Can you imagine having to explain that? But Mary was willing. May it be unto me as you wish. May you do for me whatever is in your heart, O oh God. Beautiful story of Mary saying yes. And he says to all the young men and women in the room, he says, make sure that you set an example in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity. He says, Timothy, the worst thing you can do for the church is to neglect your gift. Do not neglect your gift. Now, I wanna read this scripture to you, 2 Timothy chapter one. I love this, 2 Timothy, he says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, listen to this, through the laying on of my hands. So I'm gonna do something, I'm not trying to embarrass you this morning, please know that I, I would never embarrass young men and women. I know that they are easily embarrassed sometimes. But I'm gonna ask you if you're under the age of 30, would you stand up? And I wanna pray over you. If you're under the age of 30, some of you are, are lying, so just sit back down. <laughs> You've been telling people you're under 30, but you're not. I'm, first of all, I'm moved by how many of you are in the room right now. Can we just thank the Lord that you're here with us? <laughs> Stay standing, I wanna pray over you. Again, I'm not trying to embarrass you. Maybe you've never done this, but just turn your hands this way. And let me as a, I'm old enough to be all of your dads. And I wanna pray a fatherly blessing over you right now. Just turn your hands, Father in heaven. Come on, stretch your hands toward them. Father in heaven, these are your servants. 
There is no junior Holy Spirit. And I pray right now that the gift of the Holy Spirit be fanned into flame, that you would fan into flame the gifts of God that are in them, that are inherently in them. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them, that you give them sound mind, pure hearts, clear speech. I pray you would open their eyes, give them eyes to see and ears to hear. And I bless them and pray strength over them. I'm grateful for them. I pray they would feel the warm embrace of the church today. This is their church. They, they are leading the church. They're out front of the church right now. And I bless them for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Thank you so much. Fan into flame. And all of this is a direct result somehow, Paul is trying to tell us, of the laying on of hands. So I want to show you a few things about the laying on of hands today. Number one, the laying on of hands requires relationship, requires you getting to know people. First Timothy 5 says, don't be hasty in the laying on of hands. Why? He says, well, get to know them first. In fact, let me warn you of something. Don't let someone lay hands on you and speak over you that you don't know. That, I mean, it, be, it, it, I'm not saying never to let that happen. I'm just saying be careful of who you let put their hands on you and bless you. Because sometimes it's not a blessing. Sometimes it's manipulation. And I'm asking you to be careful about this. Make sure it's someone you know and trust or is trusted by someone you know. When people lay their hands on me, I'm, I'm careful about that. I want it, I need it, I desire it. But it says don't do it unless there's a relationship that's been formed. Let there's some kind of known trust between the two of you. So the second thing is laying on of hands actually begins at home. Moms and dads, the single greatest gift you can give your children while they're home, grandparents while your grandkids are around is lay your hands on them every single day. Deuteronomy 6 is a Shema, it tells you how to raise your children, that's the Jewish tradition of raising your children. In that passage of scripture, it says there are two times when your child's heart is most open to a conversation, two times. And I find this to be true in 2022. When you're on a trip with them or before they go to bed. So you know what I've been doing with Abram? In fact, Abram will be going on a trip with me soon. And I'm taking him on that trip, why? To have conversations. Callie still loves to go on trips. She's 22 years old and she still loves to go on trips with dad. And it's while we're in the airport or while we're in the car driving that we, her heart opens up to me. Abram wants to have long, unhurried conversations. Why? Because we're there together on a journey together. And the second time the Bible says is while they're laying their head down at night. So when, from the moment Abram and Callie came home, babies, a few days old, until now, there have been very few times that they've gone to bed before I laid my hands on them. I remember, I was thinking about this this morning that Abram and Callie, we got into, it was such a habit at our house that Abram had a bedroom, Callie had a bedroom, and they would both lay in bed and wait for me to come in before they went to sleep. And they'd be waiting for me because they knew what was about to happen. Dad's gonna sit down on the side of the bed. I'm gonna lay my hands on them. I'm gonna read a scripture over them. I'm gonna pray back that scripture over them and I'm gonna bless them. But I'm gonna put my hands on them. Listen, moms and dads, if you've never done that, start that tonight. If you've got a teenager that's kind of gone sideways on you, it's hard for your teenagers to be upset with you when you are blessing them. And you may be aggravated at them, but you're speaking life over them. Moms, I know there's moms in the room. You, you have babies in your womb. Right now, put your hand on that womb and pray, bless them, let them feel your touch, let them know that you're present, and let it start at home. It says that his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, those are the two women in, in the book of Acts. When we're introduced to Timothy, it says he had a grandmother named Lois and a mother named Eunice who laid their hands on Timothy when he was a young boy. Laying on of hands also requires humility. Now I'm gonna say a phrase. And tell me what you hear when you hear this phrase. Submission to authority. It feels, it feels angry. It feels like a violation. But that, when the Bible talks about submission, when the Bible talks about this, it's not talking about a Lord overseeing someone that's beneath them. 
It's not like a slave to a, ma a master to a slave or an employer to an employee. That's not the language that the Bible is using. It's actually looking like, the, the, like a hen. Think about a, a chicken, a hen, with her wings outspread and little baby chicks coming up underneath the wings. That's the language the Bible uses when it says submission to authority. It means you're going to a place of strength, going to a place where you can be overshadowed and protected. And it says it requires humility. Let me show you this photo. It's a photo of Pam and I, my very first Sunday here. This is 15 years ago. That was 20 pounds ago for me. <laughs> and this is, we're right here. I'll, I'll never forget the morning. I, I've never been more protected and covered than I am at that moment. You see, I didn't feel like they were telling me, bow down, we're putting our hands on you. No, I said, no, Brady, let us come around you. Here's, here's when I see that photo, and that photo's in my office. I see it every day when I go to work. What I felt in that moment was not someone lording over me. What I felt in that moment was someone over covering me with their blessing. Their hands of protection were over me. I didn't feel alone. I felt covered. I felt blessed. I felt the strength of those men as they prayed over me. And I have felt their strength every day for 15 years since then. But my role here as elder started was surrendering myself, allowing someone else's strength to be brought to me. You know, a few weeks ago, we had uh, John Egan up here. And he, uh, when I began to pray over him, I got really emotional. I mean, I lost it. And I thought to myself, why? But because I've known him. He, he's my friend. 15 years, I have watched him grow up in strength here in the church. I've watched him mature. I've watched him become this grown man who, who has strength and power and anointing on his life. And when I put my hands on him, it was an affirmation of everything that I'd seen go on in his life for 15 years. And that made me emotional. And the laying on of hands is powerful. It, it, re, it requires physical presence. Listen, you know what the real pandemic in America has been the last three years? It wasn't a virus, it was loneliness. More people today in America, and every research proves this, more people in America today are lonely than ever before. And yet we have multitude of platforms of social media. We have instant access to the thoughts of every human being on the planet. Like it or not, you have so much access to information, and yet we have so little access to physical presence. In fact, one of the most heartbreaking things that I went through when we had to close the building for a few weeks was I didn't get to see you. I mean, I can preach to you and you can watch online and I can preach to you and you can listen to music and engage in some kind of worship online, but until you shake someone's hand and hug them and bless them, you're not the church. See, the church is formed by the laying on of hands, the physical presence of the people. Every doctor in the room will tell you that the best medicine that you can give someone who's wrestling with mental health or even physical health is a warm hug. That, the touch of a hand on your shoulder, there's endorphins that are released in the brain that are actually healing endorphins, healing things, toxics and chemicals are pushed to the side. Why? Because we were built and designed by God to need physical presence. Here's the last thing, laying on of hands requires unity. It requires you to come to them, to bless them, and not to harm them. Well, how does that happen? Let me show you this, First Timothy 2. Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray. And when you pray, lift up your holy hands without anger or disputing. So in that moment of worship, in that moment of prayer, you have to decide right then, are these hands holy or hurtful? How will my hands be used? When I'm around people, am I gonna point an accusing finger at them or am I gonna lay my hands on them to bless them? See, it's in the moment of worship, in the moment of prayer, that you decide these hands are gonna be used for holy things. I'm not gonna point at you. I'm not gonna accuse you. I'm not gonna shame you. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm going to bless you. I'm gonna lay my hands on your shoulder, even if I disagree with you, even if I have firm disagreements against you, these hands are holy and they're gonna be used for holy work. Placing my hands as a friend on your shoulder, praying blessings over you. Here's what I've found as I'm getting older in life. It's really hard to be offended at someone who's laid their hands on us, prayed over us, and blessed us. 
I, I just can't be mad at you. Well, what would happen if we showed the world a, a different way of disagreeing? What would happen in the world if the church could really model this? That a yelling and vitriol and anger at one another. What happens if we get gathered together? And I'm not saying to sweep all, everything under the rug. I'm talking about having honest conversations, share your different perspectives. But at the end of that conversation, regardless of how much you disagree, how powerful would it be to lay hands on one another, pray a blessing over one another and walk away as friends? See, the world doesn't know how to do that. The church knows how to do this. And I'm sorry that I have not taught more on this because this is, according to Hebrews 6, this is one of the foundational doctrines of the church is the laying on of hands. My dad passed away in December of 2005. Next month, it'll be 17 years since he's been gone. I, I miss him all the time. I find myself wanting to call him. I don't know if you've lost a parent, but I wanna call him. I just tell him about my day, you know? My dad was not a born again Christian until after I was out of the house. I was in college. I was 19 or 20 years old before my dad found the Lord. He was, um, when I tell you stories about my dad, I don't wanna paint this heroic picture like he was larger than life. He was a flawed guy. I mean, he would tell you that he's very flawed, broken even, violent when he was younger. And, but one thing he did well, is he laid hands on me as a young boy, and I'm guessing between two or 3,000 times probably, growing up, he'd put his hands on me and say, Brady, I love you, and I'm so proud of you. You're so smart. I can hear his voice right now. Brady, you're so smart. I love you, I'm so proud of you. And he'd look me in the eye and he'd put his hands on me. And someone this week asked me, what's the one thing you miss about your dad? And I said, without hesitating, it took me two seconds. Says so his touch, his hand on my shoulder. That's what I miss most. Putting his hand on my shoulder. I'm in my 30s when he died. I was in my, I was 37, 38 years old. And I still needed my dad to lay hands on me and bless me. I remember the last time he touched me. I was in the living room and he's dying. He's barely breathing and he's sitting in his chair. I can see him right now sitting in the chair. And I knelt down in front of him and he put his hand on me. And that was the last time he ever touched me. Listen, I don't know if you grew up in that house and I'm not trying to uh, uncover old wounds here. I know many of you, I had scores of people after the first service tell me that their dad had never done that. Their dad had never told them that. Their mom had never told them that. Listen, I, I'm not here to relive the past with you. I'm here today to chart a new future for you. I'm here today to remind you that your father in heaven sees you, he knows you, he loves you, and he is proud of you. And dad's in the room, listen, make no more excuses after today. Every dad in the room tonight before you go to bed, lay your hands on your children or in your grandchildren. And if, you're, if your marriage is sideways, if you're going through a rough patch in your marriage, I can 99% guarantee you a cure. Look at each other, come close, Put your hands on each other's shoulders and bless one another and do it every single day until a miracle happens. Your marriage can be saved with your words and your touch. That's how powerful the laying on of hands is. Something happens in that moment that doesn't happen in any other moment in your life. And so today, we're gonna do a couple things. I've asked John and the worship team to sing the blessing over us today. Because I, I, I'm, I'm very aware that some of you just don't know how to pray that. How do I pray over my children? So we're gonna sing this song, and if you can't think of anything else, just pray this as you're singing it over them. So if your children are here with you, I want you to gather them around you. If you're here today with your spouse, would you just gather together as a married couple, put your hands on each other's shoulder, and bless one another. If you're here today by yourself, maybe you're unmarried, you're single, uh, you're here by yourself today. At the end of the service today, I've asked our pastors and elders to come down. We're gonna have a robust group of people down here. And if you've never had someone lay hands on you and bless you, they're ready to do that today. In fact, I don't want anyone walking out of this room that hasn't had someone just pray a blessing over them today. Let's model the laying on of hands. Stir up the gifts of the Spirit by the laying on of hands today. Stand up with me this morning.
If you're there with a close friend, you doesn't have to be family. Maybe you're here today with someone you've known a long time, a close friend. That counts. Friendship counts. So if you're here by yourself, in just a moment, we'll pray over you. But if you're here with someone, put your hands on them. Bless them, strengthen them. And let's sing this song, Father in heaven, would you come now and heal? I just pray that healing would break out all over the room. People watching online right now, I just pray for healing to burst forth. Healing to burst forth. And Lord, we thank you that you've blessed us so that we can bless others. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lay your hands on those around you. Let's pray this together. Let's sing together. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and
Will you grab your elements as we get ready to receive together at the table of the Lord? It's the table of the Lord where Jesus motions us in close, doesn't he? And he says, there's the collective you, my body, and then there's you and I. Pulls us in close, calls us by name. Says, this is myself and I'm giving it to you. It's very personal. You know, sometimes when we think of Jesus, maybe when we haven't read, read the Bible in a while, we think of some disembodied spirit that hovers around and did stuff. When the opposite is actually true. And over and over and over in the scriptures, we see that Jesus laid his hands on people. John 4, it says they brought this huge crowd of people struggling with very various forms of illness and Jesus laid their hands on them. You think of his disciples, right? He washed their feet. And on the night he was betrayed, he undoubtedly pulled them close and there was hugs and embracing and blessing. And when he took the bread and the cup, he put his hands on it. He took the bread, when he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you, given for all of you. Whenever you partake it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And then he took the cup, said, this is the covenant in my blood, not a, not a contract or just some verbal agreement, but a covenant made in my blood. Whenever you take it, remember that I did this for you. Let's take the cup together. Church, let's continue to sing blessing over one another. May his favor, may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. so good. Amen, church. He is so good. What a beautiful morning he's given us today. I want to go ahead and invite our elders and our leaders, our pastors to come forward. As Brady said, maybe you're in the room and you've never had anybody lay hands on you and just pray a simple blessing over your life. Don't leave if that's you. Come forward and let someone just take a minute and pray over you. It is powerful. It can change the trajectory of your life. Before I, I have you, invite you to come forward officially for prayer, I just, uh, I, a couple things. First, section 12, last section party of the year for you guys. Are you excited for this? You get to go enjoy a meal together. And so that's happening. Also, if you're new today or in the last few weeks at New Life and you, you really haven't felt like you've gotten plugged in and taking the next step in the church. If you go out these doors and to your left, we have leaders ready to answer your questions and just get to know you. We'd love that chance. So church, before we dismiss, would you just open your hands? I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you before we go. 
New Life Church gathered at the 11 o'clock service. May this week you taste and see that the Lord is good, that he has blessed your life, that he wants to pour his Holy Spirit upon you. And wherever you go this week, even the simple mundane errands that you run, may you be a blessing to the world. May you be a reflection of God's great generosity in his heart to the world. I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, and the church said, come down for prayer. Hope to see you soon.